So when we're talking about social control, we can focus on informal means of social control or formal means of social control. Informal social control refers to the reactions of individuals and groups that encourage us to conform to norms and laws. This includes a variety of behaviors, such as peer pressure and community pressure, bystander intervention in a crime, and collective responses, such as citizen patrol groups. Informal social control also includes the heavy sighs that we get from people, the disappointing glares that we get from people, the ridicule or shame that we get from people when we're not conforming with what they think we're supposed to do. Our values and the values of society are frequently products of informal social control. The informal social control is exercised by a society without explicitly stating what those rules, norms, or customs are. So those informal sanctions can include, like we said, shame, ridicule, sarcasm, criticism, disapproval. In extreme cases, it can include social discrimination and exclusion. An example of a negative sanction is seen in a scene from the the Pink Floyd movie, The Wall, where the young protagonist is ridiculed and verbally abused by a high school teacher for writing poetry in a mathematics class. As with formal controls that we'll talk about in a minute, informal controls reward or punish acceptable or unacceptable behavior. Informal controls differ from individual to individual, from group to group, and from society to society. So what kinds of informal social sanctions we have will vary a lot depending on the context. But there are often a variety of different kinds of social, informal social sanctions that happen when we violate the rules. Now let's move on to formal means of control. And I want to start this discussion by talking about Michel Foucault. So the French philosopher Michel Foucault wrote extensively about the question, how do individuals develop a particular conscience that promotes social conformity? In his seminal 1975 text, Discipline and Punish, The Birth of a Prison, Foucault argues that the 18th century introduced a new form of power, discipline. Prior to this time, government achieved social control by regulating and punishing bodies. Deviants were controlled by the threat and frequent use of the death penalty or torture, and those activities were often public affairs, so everyone could see the deviant being punished. According to Foucault, discipline is different. Discipline is a power relation where we, as subjects of punishment, are involved in our own punishment. And the shift from public executions to prison-centered penal systems is, Foucault argues, a shift from punishing the body to punishing the soul. So rather than the state only regulating and punishing the bodies of wrongdoers, the state begins to assert social control by molding our minds, all of our minds, not just the minds of deviants, so that we are, we're educated to conform even when we aren't being directly surveilled and punished by an authority figure. So our minds are trained through the socialization process, the process, the very long process of inheriting, interpreting, and enacting the norms, customs, and ideologies of our society. Simply by living in a particular time and place, we learn to internalize the norms of society. And one way this happens is through the medicalization of deviants, Although this is not what we think of when we think of formal social control because it's not about incarceration. The medicalization is a process where authority figures change the way we think about criminal and deviant behavior. So medicalization is the process where previously non-medical aspects of life come to be seen in medical terms, usually as disorders or illnesses. A wide range of phenomena has been medicalized, including normal life events such as birth and death, biological processes like aging or menstruation, common human problems, including learning and sexual difficulties, and many other forms of deviance. Behaviors and characteristics that are considered not normal 
are given medical diagnoses. And it's important to note that what we define as not normal shifts a lot over time and from place to place. This can include non-criminal deviance based on things like appearance, such as obesity or unattractiveness or shortness, or beliefs which come to be seen as mental disorders or non-normative conduct like drinking, gambling, or certain sexual practices. All of these non-normative ways of being become part of the medical jurisdiction. So medicalization is a collective and a political achievement that requires moral entrepreneurs who champion the medical framing of a problem. A moral entrepreneur is an individual, group, or formal organization that takes on the responsibility of persuading society to develop or to enforce rules or medical categorizations that are consistent with their own ardently held moral beliefs. So moral entrepreneurs are people who believe that some behavior or problem is morally bad, and these moral entrepreneurs shape, it, shape the problem around a medical framing. But the process of medicalization isn't always simple. Turning a deviant behavior or way of being into a medical problem has many levels, and it's not a simple one-way process. Behaviors that are seen as medical problems can become not deviant as well. Masturbation is a good example of this. Masturbation was once seen as a medical problem called onanism, and it was seen as a gateway perversion. So if you masturbated, that would lead to much more sexual deviance. Likewise, homosexuality was considered a medical disorder and was only removed from the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-3, in 1973. The example of homosexuality shows that even if a behavior becomes demedicalized, it can still be seen as a problem, just not usually a medical problem anymore. And the consequences of medicalization may be both or either positive or negative. Oftentimes, it's both at the same time. The therapeutic ethos of medicine changes the moral status of both deviants and the deviant. So creating a sick role for a deviant person cuts down the stigma of being in that category, which might mean that, th that people will seek treatment for behaviors like addiction and will help the rest of society see that person, see a person with addiction as someone with a problem instead of a kind of throwaway person. Medical explanations also define symptoms of a problem, validate and legitimate troubles, and support the individual in managing their problem. And having a medical problem often means that medical insurance and treatment can be included. However, there are also negative consequences for medicalizing deviance. The sick role, for example, may provide a medical excuse for deviance, and it certainly di diminishes individual responsibility. As the medical model becomes more attuned to physiological and genetic causes, of behavior, blame shifts from the person to the body, which further displaces responsibility. Medicalization justifies other powerful methods of social control, particularly medication and surgery. Depressed? Take a pill. Your body doesn't have the shape society wants? Plastic surgery. But the biggest problem is that we think of medicine and science and even therapy as helpful and neutral forces. We don't think about the ways that medicine and science create an insidious expansion of social control. When we medicalize a problem, we depoliticize the cause of the problem. We individualize the cause onto this one person's physiology. Depression is a good example. Why are so many people taking antidepressants? It's not a question that we ask. Depression is a medical condition, so you treat it with pills. But if depression is a legitimate response to repressive social conditions, taking a pill won't solve that. So focusing on the individual symptoms of something like gender identity disorder or intimate partner violence, for example, can also deflect attention away from things like the heteronormative gender order, from gender inequality, from patriarchal values. 
So typically, though, when we think about formal social control, we think of state-determined social control through the creation of laws and their enforcement. So let's turn to these state-determined methods of social control. Formal means of social control are exercised by the government and other organizations of authority. They use law enforcement mechanisms and sanctions such as fines and imprisonment to enact social control. In democratic societies, the goals and mechanisms of formal social control usually come through legislation by elected representatives. This gives the control mechanisms a measure of support from the population and contributes to voluntary compliance. We had a role in ensuring this legislation came to be. The social control mechanisms used by the state take a variety of forms, from the death penalty to curfew laws. From a legal perspective, sanctions are penalties or other means of enforcement that can encourage obedience to the law or rules and regulations. Criminal sanctions can take the form of serious punishment, such as corporal or capital punishment, incarceration, or really severe fines. Within the civil law context, sanctions are usually monetary fines. So that parking ticket you got, that was a civil offense and you paid a fine as your restitution. Thank goodness parking violations aren't usually criminal offenses. The jails and prisons are full enough. Well, that's it. That's all I've got. I hope you learned a lot. I'll see you next time.